Should Christians fear God or love God? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, this is, I think, the record for notes written till the time of preaching. I mentioned this in one of my walk and talks recently. Um, it has been 23 years between writing in the back, the notes section of my Bible, right here's the study that I did that I'm gonna be preaching today, 23 years later. Okay, 2001, I got this King James Bible, this Cambridge King James Bible. It has notebook paper in the back. You can write things and whatever else. Um, and one of these days, I'm going to transfer all my sermon notes over into these pages here, but always doing new sermons. So, but, you know, I'm finally getting around to doing this study. Bought this thing, like I said, in 2001, 23 years later, here's the sermon finally. Uh, a few things to do, you know. I'm not joking when I say I'm very busy. I'm sorry I can't answer emails. I can't answer people or whatever. I'm not joking, okay? And there again, you know, I've had people, I've come out and I expose the fakers like uh, Robert Breaker and Gene Kim that artificially inflate their numbers and they say, oh, you're just jealous to, you wish you had more subscribers. Uh, not really, because I have, what, 61,000 subscribers now? Thank you to all my new subscribers out there. Um, but if I had hundreds of thousands of subscribers, oh man. <laughs> it would be even worse. Uh, I really would love to fellowship with all of you, to be honest. I wish that I had some place I could go to and every one of my faithful supporters out there, you could come. Not all my subscribers because you're not all faithful supporters in terms of praying and you're not all for me. Some of you just hate my guts and you watch everything obsessively because you're possessed with devils. <laughs> I treat my subscribers well, but <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. There's people in the comments, the trolls and whatever else. They just obsessively watch everything, you know, and try to find any little thing I can. And I appreciate you. I really, honestly, I appreciate the devil possessed people out there. I do because you keep me on my toes. All right. And so there's times I mess up. I, I'm, you know, and you let me know in the comments. You love that. And I have to come out and say, yeah, I'm sorry. I was wrong on that and whatever. So thank you devil possessed people i really do appreciate you um it's wonderful so i wouldn't want to meet you in person or anything but my faithful subscribers i'd love to meet you and whatever we'll meet in heaven um if not before i have met subscribers out and about going out shopping and doing things and it's always great to talk to people so but uh let's get into the study job chapter 28 verse 28 we're going to going to look first at fearing god um when I first got saved, I came out of false professing Christianity and I was so fed up with all the nice little talky stuff and God loves you and love, love, love. Um, and, you know, what is it? John Newton, I think, that wrote Amazing Grace and, you know, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. <clears throat> it wasn't love that brought him to uh, salvation. It was fear. And that's exactly how I got saved, fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I was raised in church buildings. I was a nice little religious guy and whatever else. And I did, but I didn't fear God until I got to that point where I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to heaven when I die. Um, well, I prayed a prayer back when I was an eight year old boy or whatever, back in Sunday school or seven years old. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. And but I was thinking to myself, but I'm doing things. I have no connection to this book at all. The way these people live, the way, what they go through, it doesn't resemble anything that I'm doing. My going to church all those years, uh, I don't think that, that got me saved. Huh, you know, I started to get a little bit worried and I started to fear God. And that's what led to my salvation. I called upon the name of the Lord and said, Lord, I do believe this book. I believe that this King James Bible is your perfect word. I believe, I believe you died on the cross. And it was fear that brought me to him. And now I live in fear of God because I love God. I'm going to show you that they're not mutually or that they're not exclusive. They're actually the same thing. I'm going to show it to you in this study, understanding what it means to fear God and love God. And by the way, um, going through the King James Bible, there are 143 verses that deal with fearing God. All right, we'll be looking at a bunch of those today. And there are 91 verses that deal with loving God. Hmm. So there's more in Scripture about fearing God than there is about loving God. 
Very interesting. Job chapter 28, verse 28 says, And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. And what is going on there? Fearing God. What does it relate to? Departing from evil. Hey, hey, Brian, you know, come on over here. Let's go to this party. You know, back in high school. Hey, I mean, there's some guys drinking, you know, some girls are a little bit drunk in there. You can just, you know, kind of go in and have a little fun there. And I looked at that situation, even as a lost professing Christian, I looked at that and I just thought, yeah, okay. And I've seen some of the teens in my church building that are coming out and said, oh, you know, we had premarital sex and, and uh, fornication, in other words, is the Bible word. And, uh, you know, so-and-so here, she has a baby now. She's pregnant with child again, is the Bible word. I grew up in, a, in sort of a what, what is now a modern church, but back then it was just a new version church. Uh, rejected the King James Bible. Founded on the King James Bible, but then later on rejected the King James Bible. Go figure. But I saw that. I saw teenagers that were messing around with fornication, and the girls were becoming pregnant, and... Then they're getting married or they, you know, they didn't have abortions or anything. Um, but, you know, I'm seeing that and I'm thinking, do I really don't want any part of that? Oh, come on, man. Just come on and just take a little drink. Mm, no. <laughs> no, thank you. Why? Um, I feared God and I departed from evil. Oh, then I lived a sinless life. No, I didn't. I did a lot of dumb things in my life. Um, but I always had a fear of God. There were always a couple of things that I knew these are just off limit. There's no way. I'm not doing that. No, 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 thank you. No. So I thank God for that. Um, so again, it's not a negative thing to fear God and to depart from evil. Um, all sin is negative. All sin will hurt you. If the Bible condemns something, you can mark it down and say, I'm not going to do that. I'll fear God and I won't care what people say about me. And guys will mock me and whatever else. Go next next to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Okay. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The book of Galatians talks about that, chapter 3. Um the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are is the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Um Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them uh, there is great reward. The fear of the Lord is clean? Uh-huh. You know, I have a pretty clean life right now. You know why? Because I fear God. You come into this place here, into my office, you go out to my property, you aren't going to hear profanity. It's a, uh, we speak clean. I don't even uh, do coarse jesting or things like that or suggestive speech or whatever else. We speak very clean. Um, your children get around us and whatever else, they're not going to be, oh, cover your ears, children. They're saying things. No, very clean. Um, you come and you listen to the music that we listen to, it's very clean. The food that we eat, very clean. You aren't going to come into the place here and smell, oh man, it, you know, I'm sitting here smoking a cigarette or something and it's just the air is blue. No, very clean, very clean environment. Um, why? Because I fear God and I want to have great reward. The two are connected. Psalm 25. A lot of people have this weird notion, you know, they'll read about how that God is dealing with the nation of Israel and they're going out to string all these heathen in the Old Testament. And um, they think, oh, I don't know if I want to read the Old Testament. It's kind of scary or whatever. And so they hear about the fear of the Lord and they see him, I'm turning in the Old Testament and they say, oh, that's bad. Uh, no, it's good. Okay. It's not about this horrible God of the Old Testament or something else. No, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. You can't know Jesus Christ if you have without Old Testament and New Testament being merged. All right. 
Watch my King Jesus version studies on that if you want deeper insight. The Old Testament being the bread, the New Testament being the blood, the blood of the New Testament. Completely over the head of a lot of people. Um, no glory to me either on that. It's just what the Bible teaches. Psalm 25, verse 8 through 14. Just a little marker thing there. Um, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. <laughs> Amen to that when you think about your past. Verse 12, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> the Lord's word is so amazing. It's so deep on so many levels. You can One person can read a verse and come out with one you know, truth, and somebody else can read it and come out with something completely different and say that lines up. I'm not saying two different interpretations. I'm saying you know, two different truths out of one verse and you both go that's amazing <laughs> you know he will show them his covenant there are a lot of people out there that believe that we are in the new covenant right now they call the new testament the new covenant the new testament is not the new covenant the new versions change new testament to new covenant but we're not in the new covenant the new covenant comes at the end of the time of jacob's trouble going into the millennial kingdom that's when the new covenant comes when he saves israel from their sins huh so it's kind of funny because the people that don't fear God, they change his word and they change the word of God into a lie. See, they'll change testament to covenant. But those of us that fear God and say, no, actually, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word. Then we understand his covenant. It's coming in the future. It's not here yet. Hmm. Psalm 33. Psalms 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Can you imagine standing in awe of the Lord in the time of Jacob's trouble? <laughs> Man, the stuff that people are going to be seeing. You know, looking at all the stuff that's happening. Going to be pretty amazing. You better fear God. Psalm 34, verse 7 through 9. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. There's no want? My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, New Testament says. Huh. Isn't that a comforting thought? The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Hey, um, you know, you go to the, I should get a sign, you know, instead of beware of dog. My dog's not much of a threat. He's a little rat terrier, but, you know, um, beware of the angel of the Lord. Why? Oh, well, he's encamped on my property. <laughs> Why is that? Because I fear him and he's there to protect me. All you little goonies that want to come and get me. You're going to have to get past my God first. <laughs> Psalm 111. And there's a lot more we can go through. We're not going through all 143 references to fearing God. But go to Psalm 111. And verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Yeah, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hey, uh, little children, learn to fear God. I'm going to be starting school soon. Well, that's good, Jimmy. Good to hear that. Me too. Well, that's very good to hear, Susie. Have you been taught to fear God? Well, no. Well, then you aren't on the way to the path of wisdom. You better learn to fear God. Because you see, if you fear God, then you won't fear other people. We'll see about that here in a little bit. 
Proverbs chapter 1. Go to Proverbs chapter 1. You know, and this isn't some kind of a special thing. I've, you know, uh, some special revelations have come to me. or whatever. Just do a word study. Um, the vast majority of my preaching is just word studies. Just see what the Bible has to say about this subject. And the Holy Spirit will guide and lead and He'll show you. You know, it's kind of a, um, the Bible talks about searching for hidden treasures. Well, what do you do if you go out into the, you know, I remember hearing back in the gold rush years that they would go out, there was some river out in California, and um, don't remember what river it was, but uh, there's some guy and he was walking along and he said, he looks down and he sees a gold nugget. Wow. Reaches down and he picks it up. You know what he does? He doesn't look for an emerald next or a ruby or, so you know, piece of silver or something or some copper perhaps or, you know no he looks for more gold i found one gold nugget where's the next gold nugget well, there's another one there's another one there's another one see that's the way you go through the scriptures i wonder what the bible says about fearing god hmm i'll look up the uh, gold nugget of the word fear and i'll go from reference to reference to reference i wonder what the bible has to say about an angel are angels ever women? Well, how can I find that out? Perhaps I should look for a, a proper theological treatise by John MacArthur or some other, you know, sinner. Um, or you could do a word study in the King James Bible. Just a suggestion. Go from gold nugget to gold nugget. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. <sighs> yeah. I don't think we should have the Bible in the schools and whatever. Well, look what happened when you took it out in the 1960s. Look at the uh, degradation of society since then. Um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. You get these, you know, great minds in, in academia, and they go through all this training and everything else, and then they come out and they say, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. <laughs> Okay, it took you 50 years to figure that out. <laughs> Whoo, good one. Smart, very smart. And people, the students all sit around going, oh, he's so smart. Wow, he's so successful and intelligent. He knows nothing. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Hate evil. Pride. Hmm. Almost like the pride rallies and the pride parades and everything else. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. No connections there, I'm sure. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. had a friend, one of my childhood friends, and uh, we were talking about this the other day, and, and uh, the father, he actually had his own refrigerator in the garage filled with alcohol. And, you know, go there and stuff, and, hey, man, you want to drink something? And whatever else, open up the thing, and a bunch of guys hanging out there at my friend's house, and, and he'd look in there, and it's just whiskey and all kinds of different types of beer and, and you know, Jack Daniels over there and, you know, some uh, vodka down here and whatever. No. No. And I was a wicked teen. You know, I'd cuss with them and we'd listen to heavy metal, Metallica and whatever else while we're out, you know, raising the H word is what it was called back in those years. Probably still called that, I guess. But, you know, making problems and doing things and getting in trouble with the police and everything else. But I knew enough. I knew enough to fear the Lord because I wanted to prolong my days. I knew boys in high school that were killed in accidents. Or they got maimed really bad because they were out drinking. No, thank you. Not for me. The years of the wicked shall be shortened. Hmm. Kids that don't get through high school. That's pretty pathetic. Why didn't they get through high school? Well, because they didn't fear God. Proverbs chapter 15. 
See, people think fear God. They're thinking, oh, you know, this, this monastic kind of a thing of oh, going around and, and, you know, you say the wrong thing or you think the wrong thought and, you, oh, you know, I have to whip myself or something here. I don't have a good whip, you know. Um, that's not really good. But, you know, take some kind of whip thing and you know, oh, you just hit yourself, you know, and, you know, the Monty Python thing, you know, the, well, I forget what the movie was called, Salt, many years ago. It was just a wicked, stupid whatever. But, you know, the guys are going around, they have the, the, you know, the monks and they're going around and they're going, boom, boom. You know, they're just smacking themselves on the forehead. That's what a lot of people think of when they think of um, fearing God. But that's not it. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16, fearing God is positive. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Who wants to be a millionaire? Who wants to be a celebrity and whatever? The way those people live? No, thank you. If you saw my study on the way that they, uh, the professional wrestler guy was talking about how that these people are, you know, eating waste and drinking urine. Um, I'm good. <laughs> and thank you. Oh, but you know, you do this and you can prove that you're, you know, that you're really cool and you can really party and hang out with the, the best and whatever. And you can really go places. Uh, well, I'd rather go to the bathroom in a toilet, you know, not in on somebody else or have them go on me. You know, I don't really want to go places that way. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. <laughs> I'll fear God. It's a lot cleaner. It's a lot more profitable. Atheists, you know, this one atheist wrote a comment on my channel just the other day and he said, you know, oh, enjoy life. Um, well, guess what, princess? I do. I enjoy my life very much. I have a very good life. Um, I love working for the Lord. I love my wife and my son and we go out hiking and canoeing and kayaking and riding our bicycles and whatever. I have a great life. I didn't before when I was out there trying to find happiness like you're trying to do. You know, I remember some Catholic the one time I talked to, and, and uh, he was talking about beer and everything else. And I said, well, if you get saved, you won't need beer. <laughs> you know, you don't need to drink a bunch of slop that makes you feel sick and gives you cirrhosis of the liver. No, thank you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 through 28. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? I try to say that I'm of the devil and I'm wicked, I'm a heretic and whatever. Mm -hmm. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. You know, all the wicked, dark, horrible things and whatever else, and you try to find out this and they destroy these records and who exactly was on that list of people at Jeffrey Epstein's Island. Epstein Island, when's that coming out? You know, um, what's the, the whore that was with him, whatever, I can't think of her name right now. Um, but uh, some Maxwell or something like that, whatever her name was. Um, she goes to court, you know, they found her hiding down in New Hampshire and, and uh, she goes off to court and they're, you know, testifying and who, who's going to be named. And what. It's all coming out of the, the Great White Throne Judgment. Epstein will be there. All of his clients will be there. All the presidents of America will be there. All the popes, all the people you didn't, all the Hollywood people, all the professional wrestlers and everything else. And we as the saints are just going to be up there like this going, I'm sure glad I, glad I feared God. Look at these people down there. Ugh. What did they do? Oh, that's terrible. You know, the Lord's up there just judging them and all the world is guilty before God. I'm sure glad I took the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not my own righteousness because I'd be down there too with all those wicked people. But I can stand up here because I feared God. I didn't want to go to the lake of fire. I took it seriously. Good decision. Verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Do you fear God? I do. Romans chapter 3. 
Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Romans 3.10. I'll get there yet. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. Why don't they know peace? Verse 18, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Hmm. By the way, I'd like to point out the fact that Paul is quoting the Old Testament. So if you're a modern, churchy, little Christian out there, you say, I just don't want to read from the Old Testament. Paul just quoted the Old Testament. So the things that we read back in the Old Testament about fearing God, they're applicable to today. They still apply. You know why? Because they're still good. They still prosper. It's not a bad thing to fear God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord... We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord? What? Like Kind of like you fear God? Kind of like, you know, you realize that God is going to destroy a lot of people and burn them in hell for all of eternity? Uh-huh. Strong motivation. Hey, what do you want to do this coming weekend? Well, let me think of a way I can serve God. Why? Because I'm going to be standing in front of Him someday. And not to mention the fact that uh, every time I serve God, I feel really good afterwards. I mean, you can go out, you can drink. Get good and drunk and whatever else. Next day, wake up, bad hangover and headache and... Uh, or you can say, you know something? I fear God. Hey, how about a drink? No. No, thank you. Hey, how about a little uh, smoke here? No, thank you. I don't need to smell like smoke. It's not really for Christians. 1 Peter chapter 2. 2. And you can put it into all kinds of other things. I'm just rebuking a few little sins there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, down through verse 17. The scripture says here, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Hmm. You know that there's a, a real good way to get involved in politics? Who are you voting for, Brother Brian? Are you voting for Donald Trump? Um, no, I'm going to vote for the fear of God. Uh, whoever gets in there, I'm going to show that I fear God. What if Kamala gets elected? What are we going to do? Fear God. Works every time. Here comes Kamala. Um, I think that we're going to, uh, I think it's important and, and it would be a good thing. I can't really do the act too good. But, you know, I think we should ban the Bible because I think it really hurts people. Um, sorry, I can't do that. 
Why? I fear God. Uh, okay, I think we should ban uh, weapons. I think we should go and confiscate guns. I'm going to do it, you know, right by first however many days in office, I think she said here not long ago. Mm, no, I fear God. Uh, the Bible says I'm to provide for my own. I'm supposed to provide safety and, and whatever. And a bunch of other arguments. I'm not going to be giving up my firearms. No. Um, well, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, do whatever good thing that they might do. <laughs> whatever that would be. Okay. Good job. I'm still going to fear God. See, um, when you're a Christian, it really doesn't matter who gets elected or selected would be more appropriate way to say it. Doesn't matter. And if you think you have a real choice, you're very foolish. But now let's get into the thing of loving God. Go to 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> we have seen that fearing God is a positive thing. It's not a monastic, you know, running around, you know, in fear of God and every time you do something wrong you flagellate yourself or whatever. Uh, no, that's not what it's about. It's about saying, I understand the wickedness of sin. I understand that evil things hurt me. So I will fear God and do what he says to do. But how does love tie into this? <clears throat> First John chapter 4, verse 9. Let's start there. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You say, well, there's a contradiction. We're to fear God, but we're not to fear God. It's not talking about the, the type of fear that's through the scriptures. Fearing God, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's not talking about that. It's talking about this thing that I talked about, this monastic thing of, you know, there, in fear there's torment. Just constantly think, oh, I did this wrong and I did that wrong. Oh, no. You know, that's not what it's talking, or that's what it's talking about there. That's what it's condemning. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. All right. Um, modern churchianity has this bizarre notion that in order to show people love, you overlook their sins. You don't judge sins. I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable here today or whatever. That's not love. Okay? Um, that's essentially uh, pillow talk, if I can be very blunt about this. A man comes along and he tells, Oh, baby, I love you. You're the only one for me and whatever. He doesn't care about her feelings. He doesn't care about anything. Tell me about your childhood. Or oh, man, I don't have time for that, baby. I love you. Where's your bedroom at? I'm in love with you. You're the only one for me. You know, that's what modern Christianity is. See, true love is charity. Charity is the bond of perfectness. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about charity. If your Bible version doesn't say charity, you've got the wrong Bible. Okay? Um, charity is the perfect word there. Why? Because charity is self-sacrificial love. If you do things in charity, you're saying, I'm sacrificing my time, my money, my strength, my health, a lot of times, um, I'm going to do this for you. I have some things I'd rather do, but you know what? I'm going to show true love to you. My son this morning, he's sitting over here. Um, he took his time. He could have been playing with his toys or reading a book or whatever else. And he took his time to clean up the kitchen area here 
at the office. I didn't tell him to do it. He did it on his own. Yeah, it's charity. That's love. Not just, you know, oh, what can I do to get more money or something? Can I, get, can I do this to get an allowance here or whatever? He didn't ask for anything in return. He did it because he loves us, his father and mother. And I appreciate that. It means a lot. How can we say that we love God and then cover up for sins of people around us? We should have so much love that we can say, brother, sister, that's wrong what you're doing. I used to do the same thing. I used to be a junk food addict. I used to look at pornography. I used to play video games. I used to do all those things. It hurts you. I stopped doing that because I fear God. Because I understand how much He loves me. And He says, that stuff will hurt you. And I trust Him. I understand Him. You don't really love your brethren if you're not telling them about sin. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. <laughs> Are you looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ. I hope so. I am. Um, there's a bunch of songs, old hymns and things that talk about <clears throat> seeing Jesus face to face and, oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long till we hear that glad song, you know, Christ returneth and, you know, and all these different songs. And, you know, if I sing those two, two you know, back to back, a whole bunch of them, I start choking up and I can't sing and I'm crying and bawling because it, it just... I look forward to it, you know? And I came out against the doctrine of imminency because it's, it's wrong to say that Jesus could have come at any time from the church being first founded in the first century the whole way up till now. Well, that's a stupid teaching, all right? But in terms of today, now going forward, I'd say it's, you know, getting pretty imminent. It could happen at any time. And there are times I get so down and so just bothered by the, how bad the world's getting and I just think there's just no hope for us to be able to have a decent future and I just say, Lord, could you please come back? And I think about it and I think, what is it going to be like to see that time and to hear my name called and look up into heaven and I see a door open in heaven and a voice, as it were, a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter says to John, I think we're going to see it as well. I think John was transported into the future to the catching up of the body of Christ and he saw it and he recorded it because it's the next big thing in history. Between Jesus Christ rising from the dead and going up, his church is going to do the same. And in between that is the church age. I'm looking forward to it. I love his appearing. And I'm going to get a crown of reward if I stay true to that. But if I get a little carnal and just kind of start falling away, oh, I hope Jesus doesn't come back. I mean, I've preached so many times on the, <clears throat> you know, the catching up of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, pre-trib rapture, people call it that. <clears throat> I've preached so many times in church buildings on that. And, I, you know, and I've looked out, Jesus is coming soon. You know, I get, I get all excited and everything. And I'm looking out in the congregation. And I remember I'd see people and they'd be going, glaring at me and I'm thinking you're a Christian you were singing special music at the beginning here and now you're just talking to Christians you know and I think Jesus is coming soon oh, really I hope you're wrong I hope not you really think that the rapture is coming soon oh man and I just think whoo you're not earning the crown <clears throat> first Timothy or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 9. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the, the Lord of glory. <clears throat> but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that 
love him. Do you love God? <clears throat> Are you looking forward to seeing what's up there? I mean, I've been to some really beautiful areas in my life. Uh, I live in a beautiful area up here in northern Maine, but I've been to Montana, out to the Rocky Mountains. I've been to Alaska, um, fished on, I think it was, uh, I can't remember the name of the lake up there that my brother took me to, older brother took me to. And we're out there on this, in his boat fishing. And you, I mean, it's 20, 30 feet deep in areas. And you can see straight to the bottom, just like you're fishing on top of a, a sheet of glass or something. I mean, it was so clear. And um, <clears throat> going out there and fishing in the, the ice runoff and everything else. And there's eagles flying overhead, bald eagles and, you know, and catching these big salmon and things that are spawning going up north. And I've been to Costa Rica to see all the, the beautiful jungle out there. And I've been literally went to Poaz, the volcano down there in Costa Rica. And I'm standing on the edge of an active volcano looking down in and, and there's all the tropical beauty and these I remember they had these huge, big blue butterflies, dark blue, just bright blue butterflies. They're beautiful, just flying around in the wild out there. Um, you know, orange groves in, down in Costa Rica and the beautiful flowers. And I was swimming in one of the mountain streams down there and I saw this. It looked like a rock and it turned out it was a fish and it was swimming. And, and just went out into the uh, Caribbean down there and was scuba diving in the Caribbean back when I was in high school, just many years ago. And um, <clears throat> seeing all the little saltwater fish, the little red and, and blue and yellow, beautiful little fish swimming around. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I remember the one book I have, I don't know if, I think it's out in the, other, in the hallway there, One Man's Wilderness, Dick Prenicky up in Alaska. And he was dealing with a bush pilot that was nicknamed Babe. And this bush pilot would come and, and Dick Prenicky walked out there, you know, this lake out there, beautiful where he had his cabin built and everything else up on the bank of this lake. And he's out there and, and he said, Dick Prenicky says to Babe, he says, uh, man, he said, if there is a place called heaven, he said, I think it's going to look like this. He's looking around, just beautiful morning. Everything's just perfect. And Babe looks at him and he says, man, he said, this ain't nothing but a dung heap compared to heaven. <laughs> That's right. Amen. It isn't anything but a dung heap down here. This is a, I mean, think about this. This is a wrecked earth. This earth that we see, all the beauty and everything, this is what's left over after the flood destroyed it. What was it like before the flood? I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Romans 8, 28. Go there. Next in your Bible. <sighs> Can't even fathom. I mean, imagine getting up there in the streets of gold. You know, you see a gold coin now. Oh, you know, wow. One ounce gold coin. How many ounces is it when the street's paved with gold? Then you're walking past and there's a wall and there's this big, huge gemstone shining. Walking around New Jerusalem. <laughs> wow. And you want me to go back to the world? Yeah. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for them. Or, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. One of the most precious promises that there is in your entire King James Bible. For Christian today, go to John chapter 14. And again, it's been said, very well said, about how that <clears throat> a lot of times ingredients might not look very good, but if you put them all together, all things work together for good. You might not want to eat a cup of flour or a tablespoon of salt or something, but you put it together and you get, you know, pancakes or something good like that. John chapter 14, verse 15 through 24. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Hmm. So the comforter, the spirit of truth, Jesus is talking about the spirit of truth that's going to come. And then he says, I will come to you. He's speaking as God at that point in time. The Holy Spirit is within him. So he can speak as Jesus can talk as if he is the Father. He can talk as if he is the Holy Spirit because it's one being. But understand that they're separate. Okay? Godhead doctrine again. Beautiful truth. Verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, the good Judas, in other words, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You know, it always blows my mind when I hear these people that attack the King James Bible, because they, have, they don't have anything to replace it with, other than their opinions. It's kind of a weird thing. And um, it's very simple. Logically speaking, if you love Jesus Christ, you'll have a love for his word. Oh, no, I love Jesus, but I just don't love his word. <laughs> but that's the thing that separates you from the lost world. If you're saved, you'll have a love for the book. I love this book. This is one of the most beloved things in my life. I can't imagine life without the King James Bible. I've tried out the other ones. Most of my life, I was using new versions as a modern professing Christian. They don't work. I didn't love them. But this book, this book is something else. Psalm 145. Psalm 145. So I started out going from Old Testament to New Testament. Now I'm going to go New Testament back to Old Testament, if you haven't noticed that. Psalm 145. There are verses in the Old Testament to talk about loving the Lord. It's not that Old Testament is where you fear God, New Testament is where you love God. No, it's in both Old and New Testament, fearing God and loving God. Psalm 145 and verse 20. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. If you love God, he will preserve you. Psalm 97 and verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Huh. Almost exactly what we read earlier about fearing the Lord and hating evil. And that he would preserve the souls of his saints, and deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. So you see, if you take the two verses, the two different passages there, the two concepts, if you will, fearing God, you fear God because you love God. You love God because you fear God. It's not that they're two different things. Oh, in the Old Testament, they had to fear God, and now today we love God. No, it isn't that way at all. You know, that little boy over there right now, he's got a fear of me. You know why? Because he knows I'm a lot bigger than him. He knows if he does wrong, he's going to get punished. But uh, do you understand that I love you? Nod his head, yes. <laughs> of course he does. He sees. And when he does right, I reward my son. Why? Because my heavenly father rewards me when I do right. And when he does wrong, I have to punish him. Because I love him. Same thing with the Lord and me. I do wrong, the Lord says. Shouldn't have done that. I have to punish you now, son. Oh, you know, something bad happened. Oh, yeah, that's right. I shouldn't have done that. Or... And finally, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Last one we're going to go to. You can do the study on your own. And um, 
be a great blessing to you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's not a trinity. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. This book needs to be part of your life. You need to raise your children according to the scriptures. Teach them to fear God. And you know what? Let me just say this for the atheists out there. Just assume for a minute. We'll just say that there is no God, just for the sake of argument here. There is no God. But it, if you, even if there is none, which I don't believe for one second, but... um. You need to have a relationship with him. Or, or excuse me, seeing somebody pulling in my lane here, I'm going to have to get going. But um, even if there is no God, okay, it still is a thing, a great help for you to raise your children with a standard, a moral standard. Okay? So, um, sorry I have to cut this sermon short here, but there's somebody outside and need to get out there. So, um, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this sermon. See you in the next study.